Okay, welcome to this episode of the Athletic Fitness and Nutrition Podcast. My name is Paul Burgess and I'm here today with Francesca. Now, let me try and see if I can get this right. <laughs> Mastro Gianni? Very close. The J is silent, so it's Mastro Gianni. Yes. <laughs> um, and Francesca is um, a pretty clever girl, actually, because she deals with a lot of... Um, kind of holistic functional medicine kind of stuff and healing people and fixing things and uses a really interesting uh, range of approaches. And we met, um, we've met actually a little while ago, but we met more recently at an exhibition for a company we were both helping out. Um, I'm going to say helping out because I didn't get paid for it. And um, <laughs> and I'm hoping that you didn't. But um Anyway, uh, and then we got to chatting and I just thought she would be a really good guest to have on because um, a lot of the stuff she does is very practical and, and re relevant to um, people that, that can take action on it rather than being very complicated and um, all sciencey kind of stuff. Um, anyway, I'm chatting on. Uh, Francesca, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paul. Brilliant to have you on. And um, before I go spoiling the story tell us about you and how you've got into the business sure so i'm a i'm a as you said i'm a functional nutritionist um and a heart math coach as well which you'll hear more about um so i see people with a whole range of conditions really from um, digestive disorders to stress and anxiety um, and also some complex cases like chronic fatigue or immune immune dysfunctions um, and I practice, I'm based in London uh, busy London and I also run some uh, student clinics at the College of Naturopathic Medicine here in London and I generally just enjoy teaching and educating people, anyone who is interested in knowing how to support their health uh, naturally using food um, and using lifestyle. So um, I'm really, really passionate about that. Um, and I just, I really thrive on being able to support people achieve their, their health goals. And, and how, did you, how did you originally get into it? So I uh, used to I used to work in conventional healthcare actually. So I used to uh, be a speech and language therapist, and I specialised in neurology and neurosurgery. Um, and that feels like a long time ago now. But um, I came I came up against some personal health challenges, and there were seemingly no solutions. So I refused to to give in to that, and I uh, pursued lots of different avenues to try and help myself become better uh, and, and achieve better health. Um, and that's how I came across the world of nutrition and, and functional medicine. And I decided that it was something I really wanted to delve into deeply. Um, and it did the trick. It did the trick for me. Uh, mm. And I decided I really wanted to help others and, as well who might be going through that's, something similar. Yeah, that, that's not an uncommon story. We, we hear a lot of people that got into the industry because – conventional medicine potentially just wasn't fixing what they needed it to fix and they, they went off on what used to be called alternative medicine or mm. looking for an alternative solution to it and they found it via something like functional medicine. Um, do you know what, very quickly I want to uh, make an apology to somebody. Somebody um, contacted me on Instagram, uh, Debbie Kendall, who probably doesn't even listen to this podcast anymore because so I'm really upset her. And um, oh, she is a, she's a type 1... Um, diabetic uh, pediatrician and um, also pediatric diabetic consultant and, and I made some comments on a recent podcast about how uh, potentially, doct potentially doctors don't um, use uh, an optimal approach to it and uh, she had a very very interesting go at me on, on Instagram so I want to apologise to her for probably upsetting her. Um, and all I'm going to say is, clearly she does a fantastic job and some of the ranges she uses is very relevant and that's great. I do see other people using ranges that aren't great. And, um, and just before we started recording this, I was talking to someone in Australia um, who had a type 1 diabetic son and she's told by her doctor that a range of 8 to 10 blood glucose is fine. Um, and it's not. 
and uh, and so um, you know different people have different experiences. But I just want to apologise to her. So sorry, Debbie. Um, didn't mean to upset you. Sorry. Back to where we were. Right. So yeah, people come into this industry because they're trying to fix something, um, or the conventional medicine doesn't quite work for them. Um, and and I had this conversation again with somebody the other day about you know it's interesting. Someone's talking about oh, yeah, but they're a doctor. Um, do you know what it was? I was talking about Jess Armine, right? You know him. And, yes. yeah. and some were saying, oh, they listen to him on the show and this, that, and the other. Yeah, but why don't people go to doctors? And I said, well, I would suggest that most of his patients probably have gone to doctors. Mm-hmm. And it's after that that they go on. And it doesn't mean doctors don't work because they clearly have a really important role to play, especially in things like accident emergency and stuff like that, operations and things. But there's yeah. always other approaches. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's about um, distinguishing, first of all, acute needs from chronic needs and what is our health system geared towards supporting, probably more the acute side of things than the chronic. And I think, you know, the the, the struggles in the NHS are here in the UK are uh, indicative of that. Um, but but also I think that there's that there, there tends to be a little bit of a polarization so people can get very stuck in their in their corner in their camp and the reality is it doesn't have to be an either or you know I I get really excited when I think that maybe at some point in the future we can work in an integrative way and you know people who practice uh, nutrition or lifestyle medicine can work together with more conventional doctors um, and that essentially I guess is what the world of functional medicine is also trying to achieve so watch this space yeah. and here's hoping I agree and uh, Rowan Chatterjee is, is doing that kind of crossing over from a GP to a functional and this that, and the other and I've had so many conversations with him about coming on the show it's ridiculous and um, yeah. and we keep trying to get a date in and we keep missing it but but so he's a really good example of it um, but at the same time, you know, there are certain circumstances where antibiotics are needed. So, Absolutely. You know, there's nothing Absolutely. wrong with using them if it's in the no, right context. Um, exactly. What's also really encouraging is I've seen, certainly when I trained um, a few years ago, there were no doctors on my course. Um, and now that I am teaching at the college, actually, there are quite a few GP students. And yeah. that is just so encouraging. It's needed. You, it has to start from that level, otherwise... Um, yeah. Okay, so this is interesting then as a total aside, are they coming on that course out of their own uh, motivation or are they being sent on it from their course? No, absolutely of their own motivation and I think they, uh, because they have a similar view to ours when it comes to health um, and actually I think one of their challenges from speaking to them, one of their challenges is that they also are uh, not then necessarily recognised by others in their profession so, you know, the, the course that they're doing doesn't, um, doesn't uh, their, their peers don't kind of look on it positively yeah, let's they say. don't recognize it because they don't understand it and so they go exactly. oh, yeah that's all mumbo jumbo it's rubbish so you know this is what this is what really counts is the stuff that we do um, yes but there's there's some you know some improvements to be made for sure yeah and, and that's why i'm so so enthusiastic about educating mm. um so you uh decided you're going to fix yourself and you did and that made you want to you become go into business if you like um and it's it's not an easy business to start in, right? You know, you, you don't you don't get people knocking your door down saying, "Can you fix me?" It's quite a hard no, bit of graft right. that you've got to do. Um, yeah. And it took me decades to get anywhere near um, being a, having a, a sustainable business in in, in my mind. Um, so, how was that for you? That transition when you started? Were you still working in the um, the NHS side of things before you? Made the leap, or did you? Um, no, I made a I made a clean cut. Um, I made a clean cut, and I decided to to launch myself completely into this profession. I did uh, in lots of different ways. So I did um, a couple of years of working for um, a detox retreat company. So I was doing a lot of uh, functional um, retreats for a number of people. Um, I worked in an eating disorders clinic for a little while. And all the while, kind of trying to, to build my own practice as well. And more recently, I've got into doing the, the student clinics at college, which I'm really enjoying. So a bit of a mixed bag, but I, I decided that I needed to really throw myself into it if I was going to make it work, and, and I just wanted to embrace it completely. So, Brilliant. And so here we are today. 
successful practitioner, busy girl, um, all over the place. And one of the big things that you trained in was uh, this thing called heart math. Yes, that's right. So um, heart math, which I, I will I will explain a lot more about, but um, essentially it is an invaluable tool to um, help manage stress. Uh, which is abundant in today's life and definitely helping people manage stress is something I do feel very passionately about because it was a big part of my journey uh, with my own health was learning how to uh, be able to uh, meet the demands of life uh, the many demands at times uh, without my body suffering from it um, so stress you know it's something that I have I have observed plays such a fundamental role in my clients' health. Um, it's very often a trigger for disease, so it can be you know the, the straw that breaks the camel's back, as it were. Um, and if it's not a trigger, it's usually at least a, a mediator, what we call a mediator. So something that is contributing to driving that imbalance that underlies the disease. Um, so it's absolutely essential to learn how to manage stress and, and, and be on top of that in order to achieve optimal health and, and maintain optimal health as well. Um, Do you think um, we kind of grow up and, and stress almost creeps up on us? So mm. you, know, you go through school and they're a little bit stressful and some people get very stressed out of their exams and I get that, but we're quite resilient to a lot of stuff and then we go to work and then you kind of think, well, you should be able to handle it. And because it's quite um, slow in its accumulation, mm. we almost get lost in it. And then all of a sudden you turn around at maybe 30, 40 years old and have had chronic stress for 15, 20 years because somewhere in the back of our mind we're going, okay, but once I do this, then I'll be okay. Yes. But that never happens because then the next thing needs to be done and then you throw a few kids in the mix and you don't get any sleep for 10 years or whatever else it is. And then all of a sudden you come to a point where this this silent stress, if you like, that, that you weren't really paying attention to has been causing a lot of chronic issues within your system and then almost the wheels fall off and, and then you realise, oh yeah, it's all that stress. Um, and, and because we're not aware of it initially... There's very few people that actively manage their stress in their 20s. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I think what you've described is a really, really common picture. Yeah. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, it, the, the age at which it starts to manifest is becoming lower. Um, so you get you know, teenagers now with uh, you know, severe anxiety and stress who have no choice but to be aware of it. Uh, but definitely it is something that you know we, we think we're resilient, we think that we can manage it. Um, and then before you know it, it does creep up on you, like you say. Um, but I think what's important to point out as well is that there are differences between us in our ability to to handle stress. Um, and and that starts, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, that was a very loud ice cream van. <laughs> Do you want to close that window for us? I'll close the window. <laughs> It's terribly loud. That was that was, um, that was Francesca's daily delivery of ice cream that she was having. <laughs> she just didn't want us to know. Of course, dairy and sugar-free, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yes, we are different in our ability to manage stress. So, um, some of us will be uh, more sympathetic nervous system dominant and others will, might be more parasympathetic nervous system dominant. So for any listeners who, who, who aren't familiar with that language, essentially sympathetic nervous system is your fight, flight, or freeze response. So, um, you know, it's what will be, uh, it, it will be your physiological response if you are swimming in the sea and you see a shark. Uh, everything in your body will transform in a split second to enable you to either punch that shark really hard on the nose or to swim for your life faster than you've ever swum. So uh, that's the sympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system essentially is the, the opposite to that. So it's your what we refer to as your rest and digest state where things are dandy and you're relaxing and that's the state you want to be in when you're eating so you can absorb your nutrients and your body doesn't really have to deal with any stresses. So 
whether we are sympathetic nervous system dominant or not is actually established from the womb. So it's as early as that. So, you know, lots of studies now show that maternal stress in pregnancy can have an effect on an individual's later ability, the child's later ability to to manage stress, that what, what's actually happening in their body at times of stress. Um, and like you say, sometimes that person will be aware of, of that stress and others not, but the physiological effects are still going on. And so, um, you know, for me, it's been really, really important to find strategies to modulate those responses. We can't always... Um, change the stresses in our lives we can't always change the environment and change the demands but what we absolutely can change is our physiological response to those stresses and that essentially is what resilience is but when we're changing it on a physiological level then the resilience is true it's not just that we think we're resilient to it what uh what's the, the true implication of the stress <laughs> You know, what, what is it that it does to us on a physiological level? Great question. So um, when when we're stressed, um, like I say, there's a whole cascade of physiological responses um, to do with hormones principally, so adrenaline and, and cortisol. Um, and from an evolutionary point of view, we would have those responses um, and then we'd, as soon as the shark as soon as we were out of the water or the shark was dead in the water, uh, we would be able to, to get over that and come down from that. Those changes would have involved things like um, uh, our, our blood vessels constricting for increased uh, blood pressure, um, glucose, so our blood sugars uh, being raised, so uh, blood sugar being pulled out of the muscles and the liver so that we can either run or or fight um there's also uh, things like appetite suppression uh, libido suppression it really affects hormones in quite a quite a big way obviously if there's a shark in front of you your body is not prioritizing reproduction um and you know a lot of those hormones that are suppressed with uh, with prolonged stress they are um they have antioxidant properties they have a lot of benefits for us so we end up missing out on those and the other, the other, the other big um, area that is affected with stress and chronic stress is our immune system. So they end up either being suppressed or being overactive. Um, and and also uh, something that I do see a lot, um, you know, because the blood sugars are raised if you're chronically stressed, uh, that will lead to increased insulin, and then that can lead to Met metabolic uh, dysfunctions and issues leading to difficulty shifting weight and that is something that I see a lot of very stressed people uh, come to clinic and you know complaining that they're, they, they're there because they want to lose weight and I'm saying well the weight will shift as, as soon as we start working on your stress essentially. And, and in actual fact I mean I've dealt with a lot of people like that and, and the, the connection between stress and the weight gain is very difficult for them to grasp mm. because what they do is they come in and they say you know i'm i'm dieting and i'm training loads and i can't shift this weight and you go right okay the first thing i need need you to do is i need you to eat more i need you to cut down your training and they go well, you're yeah. mad that's ridiculous how am i going to do that <laughs> no no and not only that i need you to stop training first thing in the morning fasted because that's mm. causing a bigger problem than it's than it's solving and they go, no this is ridiculous i'm going to get huge it's crazy well i can't and um and they don't correlate it and obviously you need to sit down and explain it probably but um the, it's such a common thing um Absolutely. but but nowadays we don't have animals chasing us uh, in the uk that much um but but the, the modern day stresses that we face are far worse because it's chronic it's night and day it's 24 hours it's not just That's you know, right. on the on the odd occasion and it, it's as simple as, I mean, if, you're, if people are listening to this, it is as simple as sitting at your desk, eating your, your sandwich, bag of crisps and, and Coca-Cola from the garage because it's on offer at twelve, not uh, $3.99 or whatever it is, whilst working, whilst taking phone calls and looking at your computer screen. You know, that in itself is not a, a rest and digest 
parasympathetic state. You know, that's a, a highly stressed environment that you're trying to eat in and do that for 30 years and see how you get on. It's not going to not going to end well. That's right. Exactly. So nowadays, and I know we're, we're kind of talking a lot about stress and we will cover um, more, more usable things in a minute, but stress in itself, like I say, is coming to us from all angles. And it's not just... Um, uh, uh, endangerment of our life but things like financial stress and emotional stress with relationships and so on um, a lot of people a, a lot of people have um, kind of self esteem issues that cause them a lot of stress so you know I don't feel as I've achieved enough in my life or you know what's it all about and that kind of thing so that mental stress is obviously hangs heavy on a lot of people um, and physical stress in the form of exercise also produces the same underlying result, right? As long as, mm. and, and a lot of people will say, "Oh, no, I've got to go to the gym. It's my it's my quiet time. It's the time I get away." You go, "Yeah, I get that," but with it compounding everything else that's going on, and the lack of sleep that you're now getting, the, you know, maybe it's not the greatest thing to do. So, um, do you find that that's a, a common story, or is it? Um, yeah. Absolutely, and and the you know the stresses that you've mentioned are the ones that people tend not to be aware of. You know the emotional stresses, or or they they do they know that they have emo. Some people may be aware that they have emotions, but they don't realise how depleting those emotions can be, how draining. And the exercise scenario is really really common. You know a, a lot of it, it almost seems to me as well that the, the busier people who have the most stressful jobs are the ones who. Um, are really attached to their intense cardio session every yeah. day um, because they feel that that's how they release energy and release stress. But as you say, actually what's going on inside the body is that more stress hormones are being produced. Compounds it. I think most people associate stress with worry. Yes. And they go, oh, I'm, well, I'm not really stressed because I'm not worried about stuff. But yeah. there's a lot more other things that go on that, that cause the same metabolic uh, environment, the same process of events that um it doesn't need to be worry That's yeah awesome. absolutely and i'm so glad that you mentioned emotions because they play such a big role and um what we're trying to do you know what, what we talk about in heart math is you know that there are four realms of our existence there's the mental there's the physical there's the spiritual and the emotional and most people have some kind of idea of how to support themselves in the mental, the physical, and in some cases, spiritual. And when I say spiritual, I don't mean religious, but just, you know, engaging in activities that make you feel fulfilled, for example. But when it comes to emotional and blocking, um, you know, kind of um, preventing emotional drains, um, energy drains, that's where people don't necessarily have that many tools available. And that is exactly the level at which heart math um, works. Um, so I often, I pinched this term from someone, emotional diet, uh, and I can't remember who I got it from, but I use it because I, I love it. I, we talk so much, of course, about diet, uh, but the emotional diet is just as important as um, a biochemical food diet. Absolutely. And and like you say, people don't realise it has the effect on them, that they, yeah. they think worry should have, and you know, uh, it, it does creep up on you. So... Tell us more about heart math, why and how it works, and, and, yeah. and what the value is. So, yes. Um, so, first of all, I just really want to um, acknowledge the Institute of Heart Math, which is where I was able to learn all of this. Um, and they are a wonderful, wonderful organization. So, uh, thank you to them. And, and anyone listening can find a lot more information in any of the books that, that they have published. There are, there are many of them. Um, but really, it is uh, based around the concept of heart intelligence. So we tend to think that our brains are the be-all and end-all. Our brains are the thing. You know, they, they are uh, what dictate everything that happens to our bodies and all the decisions we make. Um, but actually, it's, it's not quite so straightforward. And the heart... Uh, plays a much greater role than people realize there are actually more 
there's more uh, there are more signals and more information going from the heart to the brain than there are the other way around um, and these this information comes in all sorts of uh, ways it's neurological information so nerve impulses it's biochemical information so the heart does actually produce hormones which many people don't realize um, it's biophysical or mechanical so you know there are pressure waves that the with with every heartbeat um that's different to the um the actual blood flow the pressure wave moves much faster it's very rapid and then um the electromagnetic field of the heart so the emf of the heart um you know it radiates our whole body but it radiates outside of our body as well up to 10 feet i believe so it's much much wider than the electromagnetic field of of the brain but the two interact very closely so the heart actually is a lot more involved in our being and existence and experience than than many people realize um and so um the the way that we can influence the heart um, in order to help us increase resilience, which is the end goal of what we want, increase emotional resilience and increase resilience in general, is to achieve something that we called uh, that we call coherence. So, um, coherence is a state of it's essentially a state of balance. It's a, it's a state of readiness. Um, so it's where you're not sympathetic in sympathetic nervous system dominance and you're not in parasympathetic system dominance you are somewhere in between and you're ready you're flexible you're ready to move into one or the other as the situation requires essentially so uh, the way to achieve coherence which is this wonderful state of readiness which is what we want and which is a, a predictor of health, uh, is through changing our heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is uh, different to our heart rate. So it's the space between each heartbeat, if you like. So if you imagine, um, it's, it's the measure of time between each heartbeat. So if you imagine, um, you know, the, an electrocardiogram where you see the, the pulse rate, um, the space between each pulse rate, that's heart rate variability. And, and that space is uh, very changeable. So it's not constant. And we need it to not be constant, because if it were constant, we'd be incredibly rigid. We need it to be flexible so that our bodies can, so that our hearts can handle a sudden increase in rate without any damage happening. So it's normal for there to be variability. So two people can have the same heart rate, but have a different heart rate variability. Um, and one person's heart rate variability might be very ordered and someone else's might be very kind of choppy and, and messy. And guess which one is the most healthful one? It's the one that's very ordered. So um, there are techniques that you can use to influence your heart rate variability to make it more ordered. And what we know about heart rate variability is that it is a really important predictor of health. So um, poor heart rate variability is actually uh, associated with a lot of um, future health problems, including all-cause mortality. So it's definitely relevant to, to our health, and it's definitely something worth uh, working on and working with. So I... Um... For, for a long time, used heart rate variability every morning just to see what state you're in. And whether, and honestly, I was just using it to see whether or not we should train that day or not train. Mm -hmm. you know, can your body take the stress? Uh, or does it say, yeah, actually, today should be a, a rest day for you? And, um, and you know what? I found it really interesting because it doesn't just let you recover from your workouts. All of a sudden, your sleep's better, your digestion is better, your mm -hmm. recovery is obviously better your performance is better. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and I did it for quite a long time. I, did it every I was doing it every morning. I don't do it now. Uh, and I'll, I'll, tell, I'll say why in a minute. Um, and, um, and I found it very enlightening and um, uh, just an interesting pattern of data that would come up. Um, because it wasn't like, okay, every five days you should rest. 
it would be, well, you know what, you're all right today. You can you can do that exercise or your body will handle more stress. And then other days it would be, okay, today's not a good day. Don't do it. Um, yeah. So, so it is, you know, it's random if, if you see what I mean. Um, and what was really interesting is when I flew to the, to the USA, I continued to do it. And when I, the next morning, it was, it was so bad. In, in other words, it was so low in, in its range that it basically said, you know, do not do anything today. This, is, this, this is a, a really like, you know, there's a lot of stress going on. And, and I can understand why there's a lot of traveling, there's a lot of time difference and the rest of it. And you'd expect that. Um, but I want to go back to the point that you made about the, 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 the high flying execs, if you like, um, which actually they don't need to be the directors of companies anymore. There's a lot of people in management positions that have the same problems. Is that I, I know of a lot of people that will, will fly all around the world uh, on a regular basis, like weekly. And the first mm. thing they'll do is get off the plane, whatever time it is, and go to the gym and go and run or go and do a workout. And you're, you know, I've seen it firsthand on my own heart rate availability. If I were to do that, it would be the most mm. damaging thing. Mm. And mm. you try and explain that to a exec who is, you know, running a company and getting hundreds of thousands of pounds a year and has got hundreds of millions of pounds worth of budget that they're in charge of. Um, they will not take the blindest bit of notice of you until you put a heart rate monitor on them and you and it shows it to them on their on their phone and then they get it. Yes. And, and absolutely. It's, it's it's bizarre. So and, and I'm gonna I, ask your, your your opinion on something in a minute, right? So and I'm gonna ramble on a bit, so sorry about that. But anyway, so I don't do it at the moment and I'm really annoyed that I stopped doing it. And the reason is um uh, eight weeks ago, we had a little baby, as you know. Yeah, and, um, uh, and what I should have done, and, and I was just caught up in a lot of things and I didn't do it, but what I should have done is do it for the two or three months previous to the birth and then continued after the birth uh, and to see what the numbers were and how it changed with the, because there is a lack of sleep, you know, and I am mm. particularly tired. And, um, and I would love to have had that data and that was really naive of me not to not to have done that but on a on a positive note and i'll stop stop talking now i've got an aura ring coming which gives me that uh data that that uh, heart rate variability so when it does come i'll be back onto it and uh, um looking at my own my own data again anyway enough of me talking can i ask ask paul so when when you are measuring it are you then doing any exercises to change it um depends on what kind of training I'm, I'm doing at the time because I did it for quite a long time but there yeah. would be I did a lot of meditation on days uh, I actually did a lot of it on a daily basis um, but I would do more of it or I would I would actually feel much happier not training on the days it says you know what take it easy today because a lot of people will if you say to them that you need to take a rest day they actually feel guilty about it yes. and that guilt produces more stress and then, and then it's a vicious cycle. Yeah, count, counterintuitive, and it doesn't work. So, so yeah. there's a lot of different elements that you wouldn't expect that actually come into play, and and then just improves the whole scenario. It's, it's very interesting. Yes, I agree that the the measurability of it is one of its greatest benefits because many people do need that visual biofeedback um, and so that is invaluable both in motivating people to uh, to do it but also to, to do to practice heart math but also as you say to listen to their bodies and look after themselves and think about what the best thing is in, in each moment for their health um, but it's also a really great way to to track your progress because as you practice uh, heart math and techniques that help improve your heart rate variability over time, your baseline heart rate variability does improve yeah. as well. So your overall uh, daily resilience is is bettered. Yeah, um, and and then you can still influence it in the moment and increase it even more. Yeah, certainly I found that there were fewer days, over time, there's fewer days that say you should rest today, even though the activity is still the same. So it does yeah. it does certainly improve things. It's a, it's a very interesting thing. But I was only using it from a very top line. You know, I was like, should I train today or not? How's my body dealing with stress? Okay, maybe I should do a little bit of rest or meditation or, or, or recovery. I wasn't looking at it from anything more 
deeper than that. And I know it has a lot of other very uh, other uh, other um, uh, great contributory things that it can do. So, um, uh, do you know what? There's so many things going on in my head that I want to ask you. So here's one. Um, let's say we have a client who is stressed and has been for a period of time. Putting a heart rate variability monitor on them um, will pick up because you need to do it for like seven days to get a baseline. But if, um, yes, but, but, to get but, an average baseline, yes. Yeah. But if they're already in that stressed environment, in that stressed state, mm -hmm. it's not going to give them a, a kind of a true baseline, is it? It's going to give them a stressed baseline. Yeah, that's right. Well, yes. It, so and maybe that is their baseline. So right. um, I tend to not necessarily do that. I don't. I won't monitor it over a number of days. What I do, I mean, I think if someone needs, everyone can benefit from this. Um, for some people, for some of my clients, it is particularly obvious um, the extent to which they would benefit from it. And so in those cases, uh, what I do is I actually, whilst they're there in front of me, I hook them up to a monitor. Uh, we look we look at the heart rate variability. I then get them to do some heart math exercises and they can see in real time how quickly that can change. And then that's that's my way in. And that's how they realize, oh, my gosh, you know, this, you know, this squiggly line that looks very erratic is not good. Mm -hmm. But look, I really have there are tools and I'm empowered to transform this. Um, so that's you know and then i set them up with a monitor that, that they, they can take away um and and use and i get them to use it kind of in the moment when they're feeling stressed as well as doing regular regular exercises three times a day um in order to shift it okay so from a practicality perspective the client comes in they're they've shown symptoms of various issues and something that can help them with stress Let's have a look at how stressed you are and how to manage it. You're able to hook them up to a monitor, which then in real time shows them doing certain exercises, which um, I know in the, in, in the old days, we used to use um, a Valsalva maneuver to like get some stress on and then see how it peaks and then comes back down again and then some breathing and some visualization about some stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm sure things have moved on from now. But um, what similar actually we yeah. just don't use the maneuver i just try and bring a bit we well, don't need to because they're, they're already stressed, stressed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what uh, so 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 then they come in and say okay look do this exercise and look at how it affects you right now in your heart rate and and in yeah. your parasympathetic versus sympathetic nervous systems what are the what are the um the, the exercises that you would get them to do so um, th there's there's lots of different heart math exercises, um, and I t I try to tailor them to people's needs. So um, I sp you know if if I see someone for some heart math sessions, I will specifically be focusing just on heart math for about three sessions, um, and we spend you know a fair amount of time trying to understand what's going on for them. So what are the situations in their daily reality that are bringing about the stress? And what can we do to, uh, to shift their response to that? And once we've identified those situations, then we can identify which of the heart math techniques are most relevant to, to them and how they can use them. I think that the, the best, the great thing about uh, heart math exercises, which differs a little bit from meditation in this respect, is that you can do them anywhere anytime, any place. So it's a lot based on breathing. Um, so it's breathing techniques and visualization techniques and connecting to certain emotions. Um, and you can do that anywhere with your eyes open on the tube. No one needs to know you're doing it, but it, you know, your, your experience of the rush hour morning commute will be completely different if that's what you're doing. Um, so, um, yeah, that I'd say that the, the basic, um, breathing technique which underpins all of the other techniques um, is the heart focused breathing um, and that basically involves focusing your attention on the area around your heart and some people find it helpful to actually place a hand on on the heart area on the chest area and then slowing very simply slowing your breathing down uh, so you're breathing maybe in for about four or five seconds 
and then you make the exhale the same length of time as the inhalation. So you're breathing in for four or five seconds and you're breathing out for four or five seconds. That alone can really create an internal shift, um, certainly can affect heart rate variability. That is the, the foundation exercise that all the other ones are, are then built on. So that would be the starting point. So I'll always ask someone to start with doing that for three times a day, five minutes, three times a day. So first thing in the morning, setting an alarm in their lunch break to remember to do it, and then in the evening. Um, and then I ask them to observe. You know, after a week, uh, I ask them to feedback what their experience has been, uh, what they've observed, if they've observed any internal shifts or changes in the way that they they have responded to events. Um, and very, very, I mean, always, you know, in a week, it's amazing some of the shifts that can happen just with that exercise. And then we move on to all of the more specific ones. So, so just with the breathing, what kind of changes do you, do you have feedback on? So um, people's, people's energy levels, yep. people's yep. sense of anxiety, people's sleep, um, and also their reactions to, to, to stressful... So, so I'm thinking of um, a couple of people recently, um, you know, would, be, would just feel incredibly stressed at the office, like receiving a, 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 just receiving an email would... They were so highly strung, mm. just receiving an email would set them off. Um, and they noticed that that was just not happening in the same way. So the key is that, you know, when we talk about resilience, um, a lot of people's definition of resilience is, oh, you know, the ability to bounce back from a stressful event. But actually, the heart math definition of resilience is much more complete. It talks about resilience as the ability to prepare for recover from and adapt to stress so the key there is prepare for so you are creating a state within yourself whereby your initial physiological reaction to the stress is is different to what it was before so what you have to bounce back from isn't isn't as bad in the first place do so you, do, do you ever um monitor blood glucose and and how that gets affected on on that week you know, it just for me, it'd be interesting to see what it was like for the week before, and then during the week they use the three times a day, whether or not it becomes any more uh, optimal. I think it'd be interesting. That is an amazing idea. I don't do that, um, but I think you've just inspired me to start. Do so it, I think that would be, be a really great thing to do, and, and a really good um, piece of research there as well. Because because there, there must be an, an effect on the not only their appetite, but also their digestion and the, the, the type of foods that they go for. So I know when you're calmer and less stressed, you're not yeah. so sugar driven and, and energy driven. You're more um, looking for foods that are just whole foods that you should be eating rather than I need a quick fix or I need some caffeine or whatever else it is. So um, that in itself, I think, would balance the blood sugar better but also I think the because of the stress is lower you're not going to get the gluconeogenesis it's not going to break down protein into the blood it's going to spike your blood sugar and blah 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 right so just, of, exactly yeah so just interesting whether or not um, yeah. on that note what I do use it a lot for is emotional eaters so um, you know exactly what you've just said you know if you can encourage people people who have a tendency to reach for food when when they're feeling an uncomfortable emotion to create a space between that emotion and reaching for the food and in that space do heart math exercises um, and that can really really help yeah and, and, I, and I think over time that those uh, bouts of emotion eating become less because they're more calm anyway um, exactly but yeah interesting exactly. stuff um, so it improves your resilience to stress which is great. your resilience to stress. I mean, from a, from a physiological point of view, the improvements that have been uh, noted um, over in studies over the years um, have been a reduction of blood pressure, so really great for blood mm. pressure, um, improvements in, the, um, in asthma as well. Um, people have reported increased emotional stability. 
Something else that is really um, that benefits from heart math is cognitive performance. So, the, you know how well your brain works, um, and that is um, that's an interesting one. It's uh, what they have found is that uh, when your heart rate variability is coherent, um, the activity in your brain shifts from the emotional center of your brain, so that the more primal center of the brain, the amygdala, it shifts from there to the cortical regions, you know, so where, where you do all your thinking and your problem solving. So um, you know how some people, some people in a state of stress will freeze and there can be a state of panic and that's where you see very intelligent people do very stupid things. Heart math mm. can kind of hijack that, that system, um, brings the activity back into your, your cortex so that you can continue to be very intelligent even in a moment of panic interesting, interesting. very mm. very um far-reaching kind of effects that it has which you wouldn't you wouldn't think about absolutely i mean there's more um it, it increases um iga um overall just lowers your your stress hormones and increases dhea which is you know this very regenerating anti-aging hormone um it has improvements on well here, on memory here's, sorry here's an interesting thing then on that um so i was talking to jonathan cohen the other day who we both know and um he was saying to me that there's a there's a strong correlation between interleukin-6 which is an inflammatory cytokine and low dhea and if you have low DHEA, the likelihood is you're inflamed, um, or certainly in some aspect. And so, if you're if you're calmer and, and less stressed, then that's going to bring down inflammation, which in turn is going to have that knock-on effect of pushing up DHEA, right? Absolutely. Yes. So it's a win-win. Yeah. And um, also improves sleep. Yes, for sure. Which is pretty uh, important. Ah, uh, oh, sleep. As well as is, is just so key to to our health, and most people are not getting enough of that nowadays. Certainly in in the cities, um, and certainly you know, again, you know, you want to try and understand the reason why someone's not sleeping. There can be so many different reasons, uh, but heart math does seem to help with that. And I think basically whatever the reason, it's just that heart math helps. Um, so as you're saying, in quite a comprehensive way. So it does seem to have an effect, whether it's because the person is, um, you know, not sleeping because they're they're lying awake at, at night worrying about the next day, uh, or whether it's because of some kind of a hormonal imbalance or who knows. Um, but yes, I have seen it help sleep. Okay. And then what other areas potentially is it going to particularly have an effect on or is it realistically going to be having a massive holistic effect and just improve everything to to a degree which allows things to balance themselves out um yeah i, I think it does because it is um regulating your autonomic nervous system and, and and as we know you know i think there are a lot of things that we still don't necessarily understand in detail about why hrv is so connected to future health outcomes uh, but what's clear is that it is um, and probably, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of research going into this at the moment. And I think um, we will become clearer on that. But, um, you know, the, the effects that I see it have and the way that I use it is really for general health outcomes, uh, performance and productivity like I said, emotional eating, and what you were saying before, sports performance as well. I don't use it that way because I, I don't really specialize in sports nutrition and I don't do an awful lot of that. Um, but there is a lot of research going into HRV in the sports world and athletic performance. Um, so like you were saying, you know, it, it, it plays a role in determining the ability to adapt to training, but it's also then responding to the effects of training. Um, so I think... Uh, there's there's a lot more to understand about that. Um, we know that athletes have a different HRV com compared to non-athletes and sedentary people. Um, they will be more parasympathetic um, dominant um, and have more of a parasympathetic cardiac modulation. Um, so it, and it can be used to to monitor recovery, to know when to exercise, like you were saying. Um, so definitely a big, big scope in that world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
any reason why someone wouldn't want to use it? That's a good question. I've never asked myself that. Um, I I can't think of any really because it feels very good, yeah. um, and we know that it improves health, um, and we know that it's not. You know, again, it's not bringing us into parasympathetic only, which which can have its problems if you spend too much time in your parasympathetic nervous system. But it's really bringing you into balance. So um, I don't see there can be any problems with that. Yeah, it, it's very much like a metabolic flexibility from a, a metabolism point of view, right? So some people find it very difficult to switch between burning fat for fuel and sugar for fuel. And that flexibility is is difficult for them. Other people are genetically just perfect at it, and are you know lean and bright eyed and bushy tailed, and that's all very lovely. And we all hate them. But the but working on that and getting that flexibility right, so you can tap into fat as well as glucose when you need to. Um, and this is the same sort of thing, but from a like you say, sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, so it can facilitate that because yeah. without being in those particular um, types of nervous system, you, things don't work that well. Um, so, you know, from a takeaway point of view, in my mind, even if people don't go to the length of measuring their heart rate variability, it does seem that having a bit of mindfulness three times a day for five minutes, doing a bit of breathing, won't do you any harm. And exactly. can potentially do you a lot of benefit. And a lot of yeah. us forget to breathe, right, during the day. We get so caught up in what we're doing and stressed and whatnot that you actually have this really shallow breath that just about gets you through a day and you feel exhausted at the end of it. Um, you wonder why. <laughs> yeah, 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 try breathing a bit. Um, Absolutely. And in fact, that is one of the one of the features of sympathetic nervous system is shallow breathing. So, yeah, absolutely. We're all oxygen deprived. <laughs> yeah, and, and not only that, we end up not eating well and uh, ramping a load of sugar down us, um, which doesn't help either. Um, do you know what, we, I'm sure we could talk about this for ages because we haven't really covered the majority of what it can do. Um, but I think we've touched on it enough so people get the idea of it. If people want to get in contact with you directly and maybe do some work with you on it because they feel as though it resonates with them really well and they'd like to know more, where can they find you or what's the best way to contact you? They can um, they can email me um, at francesca at nurturebyfran.co.uk um, and that's also my website. So if they want to find out more about how how I work and what I do, um, again it's nurturebyfran.co.uk. Um, so that's yeah, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Any social media? Um, I am on Facebook. Um, Again, Francesca Mastroianni on Nurture by Fran. Uh, they'll find me on there. Um, and I've, ju I've actually just joined Instagram. I've had a bit of a um, a bit of resistance to that, but okay. I think I'm gonna gonna give it a go now. So yes, they can find me on there as well. Right, so I'm gonna put links to all of those in the show notes, so people can just click on it and go directly to you. Social media is a. Uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is a destructive beast, in my opinion. And the majority of it is used in uh, a non-constructive way. However, mm. um, because it is so prevalent throughout society now, to get a message across, or to for marketing purposes, in that knowing what you do for, uh, for people, it kind of becomes a necessary evil. And, um, and we kind of need to do it. And, we do, I know. And I course, am coming to terms with that. But you know what? <laughs> it, here's the, the interesting thing. People who have got nothing good to say or no value but are very good marketers influence a lot of people. So you get people with millions of followers uh, who really have got some, some not great messages to put out there. Um, and then you get people who are really clever and, and got some really very uh, valuable information that don't have that many followers because they're not about getting in front of a camera and talking and trying to big up their themselves and all the rest of it. And um, and it's it's quite sad that a lot of people follow things that maybe aren't great for them. And and the next generation is going to be worse. But we're not going to talk about that because it'll go, <laughs> I can go on for hours on that. 
Anyway. I, I've actually just remembered that I changed my Facebook name. I think it's Nurture Well. Okay. So, um, well, I'll tell you yes. what to do. I'll that. Send me the links to all of them so they're exactly okay. right, and then I'll copy and paste them in, and then we won't have the problem. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I know you're busy, and uh, it was great to get you on. And, and it would be good to have you back at some point and discuss some of the other things that you do, because it's not just the, the heart mass stuff. Um, I'd love that. Yeah, and a lot of it's very useful for people. And, um, you know, the more we can get your name out and, and get you working with more and more people, the better. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been really great. You're very welcome. And, um, and me and you will definitely catch up soon, I'm sure. Great. All right. All the best. See you soon. Take care. Bye.